Hi, everyone, and welcome back to our uh, Faith and Spirituality interview series. This week, we are joined with our very own Deacon Mike, um, and we're very happy to have him. How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing great. I mean, in the context of COVID, I'm doing as great as I can be doing, but it's just <laughs> before Christmas. We're in our um, uh, we're, 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 we're in our final throes of Advent, so um, it's, it's great. In, so, in the context of everything bad, in this thing, it's, it's great. I am happy to hear you've maintained your optimism despite everything <laughs> that's went on. For those of you who don't know Mike, he has been our deacon at the Newman Center since uh, June of 2019. Uh, he currently serves as the director of our Rite of Christian Initiation for Adults program. Uh, Mike also, at least when we had weekday masses, would consistently do a communion service on Fridays. Uh, so one of those three masses he would do every week. Uh, Mike also does many of the baptisms that we have at the Newman Center, and he's been instrumental in us catching up uh, on all the baptisms that we missed out during the shutdown in the spring. Uh, Mike also is probably recognizable to some of you as uh, a homilist. We've, we've had homilies from him about every month or so when we were meeting in person, and he's done every a couple three of... Every three weeks. About every three weeks. Yeah, and... Mike's also done a couple of the homilies uh, for our recorded masses. So uh, he does a little bit of everything, and we're very happy to have him with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for inviting me. You're very welcome. So to start off, Mike, I've been asking all my interviewees the same first question. We talk about okay. faith and spirituality. I want to know what those two words mean to you, what you think of when you hear about them. An interesting question. So first... Um, you know what, let me start at a slightly different spot and then go right into that. Does that work for you? Yes, it does. So, um, all right, so let me just explain for a second what a deacon is and what the path to getting there is. And then let's go to your questions. I think it'll be, I think it'll help inform that. So first, um, a deacon uh, you know, a deacon is part of the clergy, but, it's, but a deacon is not a priest. So what a deacon, uh, a, a priest in, our, in the Roman Catholic Church cannot be married. And, um, uh, and, and uh, that's what it is. And they dedicate their lives to, uh, to Christ. Um, and what we do as a deacon, though, is we can be married. And, um, uh, and it allows us to also um, perform and to help the priest in a number of different things that they do. And in the Newman Center, Father, for Father Pat, um, I, can do, um, I can do communion services, but I cannot consecrate the host. I can do um, uh, I can do uh, a, a wedding, um, witness a wedding, but I cannot hold mass because it's consecrating the host. Um, I can do a funeral, but I can't again consecrate the host during an actual uh, uh, an actual uh, an actual funeral. And um, uh, and then other things that I can do are baptisms because baptisms typically don't have uh, a mass associated with them where they where you consecrate. They can, but but they typically don't. And then I can also help um, uh, help with other um, sorts of education, which is what I do, uh, and uh, to try for, uh, I, I did confirmation for 15 years, and then we did RCIA. Uh, I've been doing RCIA and some other things. It's been very nice. So let me start with that as a foundation. But also the question is, how do you become a deacon? And then I'm going to get to your question. So um, a deacon in the Catholic Church and the, Buffalo Di and the Diocese of Buffalo, it takes five years to become a deacon. You, and you end up with a master's degree in um, uh, pastoral care uh, and pastoral counseling. Um, and you can also do one in uh, a master's in uh, religious education. Um, I didn't do that. I did the one in counseling. And uh, it took me five years to do it. And uh, with it, you go, um, you do, you do, um, you, you have to take, we took classes at the seminary for those five years. And then also we did a, um, uh, uh, they had these weekends we would have to do and my wife would have to go with me. And um, uh, we did it. Uh, we did uh, 40 quick weekends, <laughs> starting on a Friday and going until Sunday. Just 40 of them. So um, we did that. But then, uh, then what the, the deacons do is they get assigned to a parish. And uh, and for me, I I was originally part of the Newman Center, and I asked the bishop if I could uh, get assigned to the Newman Center. And I get assigned here for a three-year period, um, which I hope to renew five times you know, over my time period, uh, but I get assigned for that three-year period. So that's, that's kind of what I am and what a deacon does. Uh, but what I do is, is I take my direction from Father Pat, both, uh, both from an organizational standpoint as well as a spiritual standpoint. He is my, he is my leader uh, in, that, in that effort, not just organizationally, but also 
uh, also, as I said, you know, kind of from a guidance standpoint, he is because he is Father Pat. And um, I have the ultimate respect for Father Pat and what, what he does and just what he's been able to do, especially with uh, running a Newman Center for so many years, not just at UB, but also when he was at Fredonia. So there's that. Okay, so that's, that's that. So in that context, um, what is faith? Faith to me is a decision. You decide to have faith. And I know that sounds kind of funny because you, you were, you're always waiting for this aha moment. Ah, you know, I, I have the faith. But for me, it didn't come that way. And um, uh, for me, it was, um, it was uh, if I could start backwards, what it started with for me was I did, um, I, I grew up uh, in the Catholic Church and my, and my parents, we, I was one of five children. And uh, we went to mass every Sunday. I went to say I went to St. Leo's uh, grammar school, and um, uh, and I was I was uh, it was the faith, uh, not the faith, the, the church and the uh, and and the um, uh, and the rules were drilled into me, and I had um, Catholic guilt from the very beginning. You know, I had the Catholic guilt, and my my mom drilled it into me, and my dad drilled it into me Catholic guilt, and I felt that until I was probably 12 or 14 years old. And then at 12 or 14, I think I got beyond my guilt and I didn't really, you know, I was, I was just there. You know, I would, I would go to church. I would kind of, uh, God was someone who was up there and in my mind, very far from me. And uh, it just was, it just was something that just happened. So I just, I, I would still go to church, to, you know, go through the whole, go, go through the cycles. And then in um, when I became, when I uh, went to college um, for uh, for about a year, I really fell away from the faith, and I didn't feel it. I didn't feel it was giving me something that I that I wanted, and uh, so I just didn't do anything. And uh, I went to Lemoyne College for about a year, and uh, there I started attending um, 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 the eleven o'clock masses, and they had it every night. And I just I didn't have anything else to do, so I just started going to eleven o'clock mass at night, and it was at that moment at those quiet hours at 11 o'clock to 11 30 at night that I could actually stop long enough to feel God's call a little bit to me and as I kept going it, it was it became a little louder and a little louder and at the end of um, college um, I had uh, I had strongly considered the priesthood and to become a priest uh, but it wasn't for me I really felt the married life was for me it's what I wanted to do and so I kind of went through that, and it and it um, and over time, it was still it was always a thing that was farther off. Um, I could hear Christ, I could feel, I knew what to do, and there was something innate in me that was kind of calling me to some degree, but I didn't know what it was that was calling me. And um, and that um, and it's uh, and at some point about uh, probably twelve to fifteen years ago, I really felt that I was lost. And I didn't know what it all meant to me. And my wife, Mary, said to me uh, that the point, she said, you know, Mike, you're trying to, you're, you're trying to like sense this, um, this, this inner, uh, uh, you're trying to sense something. And the reality is, is that she said to me, faith is a decision. When you decide to have faith, more faith comes. And I thought, it can't be right. This cannot be it. But I went through, and I was, um, and I went through, and I decided to have faith, and I just, it was a decision, and I decided to take the Roman Catholic Church hook, line, and sinker, all of it. I just decided that was going to be me. I was going to, you know, I believed in it all, and I was going to just, that was what I was going to do, and it took me a while before spirituality developed within me. And um, when, when I, st um, I was, uh, my call to, to become a deacon was a call that it was interesting because I had faith and I was, I decided to have faith. And then about um, maybe 10 years ago, uh, eight years ago, I was at something and somebody mentioned the word, you know, to become a deacon. And I just decided I had to do it. I had to. And it wasn't really a choice. It was just something I just had to do. It wasn't somebody over the, I didn't feel like if I didn't do it, I would die. I just felt like I had to do it. And I did it and I became that. And that's what became spirit. And then, and from there, I developed a spirituality because they teach you to pray and they teach you to, um, uh, they, they teach you, um, prayer is a very important part of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of 
understanding who Christ is in your world. And that's what I did. I went into spirituality, and, and, I, and spirituality to me is the closeness to God and the closeness to Christ and the closeness to the Holy Spirit. That's what drove me. And from there, um, from the diaconate, uh, going through that process, it changed my life entirely and pushed me right into the middle, into the center of all this. And I said, I, I want to live for Christ. I want to live the whole message of what this is, what's, what's happening here. And so a lot of this was a decision that once I made the decision, it became very easy for it to get deeper and deeper until the point where spirituality grew and enveloped my entire life. And I thought I had faith and I thought I had spirituality in my 30s. I'm in my 50s now. I thought I had it then. But until you get into the middle of it and make those decisions, you don't realize how consuming in a most beautiful way it is, how beautiful it is, how, how cons all consuming it is. And it's become that for me. Now, look, I'm a practical guy. You know, I still pay the bills every month. I have kids that are, you know, that they're just, you know, finally I get most of them out, of, out into college and I have to worry about retirement. I have to worry about all the things everybody else has to worry about. But I've just added this other dimension and this other dimension to my life has really absorbed everything. That spirituality, that closeness to, um, to, to, to understanding the two key elements of love God with your whole soul, whole mind, uh, your, your whole soul, whole mind, your whole body, a decision. It's a decision to love God with everything. It's a Shema. And the second one is to love your neighbor as yourself. And those are two decisions you make. And from there, spirituality grew for me. Does that help? That does. So I can already tell this is going to be a great interview because you, <laughs> you, you've given me a lot there. Okay. Um, so let's start with faith. Um, the decisions you were describing for us, some of them seemed pretty big. The decision to become a deacon, but some of them seemed almost mundane, the decision to go to mass at night after classes in college. Would you say that of the decisions you've made to be faithful, do those tend to be more of the significant kinds of decisions, like the decision to become a deacon, or are they more like the decisions to go to mass? That's interesting. Uh, the decisions to pray one day. Uh, yeah, what would you say about that? The decision to become a deacon was not a big decision. That wasn't a big decision. Okay. It was because it is built up. My, I look back and I think in that college, you know, when I was at Lemoyne and I decided to go to mass and I was going to mass, honestly, because I was, I couldn't fall asleep. I just said, I'll go to mass. Right. And I just went to mass. And that decision there, the first time was, was just because of that. But the second time I had, I started to make an active decision. I want to do it. And I just want to, I want to just keep going to mass. And I didn't have anything more in my head than that. I just wanted to go to mass. I wanted to, you know, I wasn't really, I knew what had been drilled into me with, with the Eucharist, but I didn't really believe it. I mean, I thought I didn't really believe it. I mean, I conceptually, abstractly believed it, but I didn't really believe it. And it took me years to understand that aspect of it. But it all started with a very small decision go to church at 11 o'clock in Syracuse at Lemoyne College more than once. You know, that, that, was, that was it. And that small decision kind of crept up on me more and more. Now, the other advantage I really have here is that I married a woman who is, um, who she grew up in Rochester, I grew up in Buffalo, and we grew, we grew up parallel lives. She also had the Catholic guilt. She also did the same. She went through the same process I did, but she was she had a stronger faith initially. She had made that decision earlier than I had, and she made that and stuck to it, and she dragged me along for a while, especially during my low spots, and it's true. I mean, she did. She's the reason I'm where I'm at now, and, you know, not just in my, not just my faith life, but in my, but in my overall life, that she's the reason where I'm at right now, but so I would say the critical decisions to me were going the second day to, uh, to, to, to Mass, not the first, going the second day there, going and going and going. The next decision really was, was to say, I want to marry the woman I married, who also had a common, had, had a common um, uh, understanding that I did. And then the third one that was also not a big decision either was when I really started 15 years ago or so, feeling that it, it was almost selfish because I was feeling 
that the physical world of what I was searching for, nothing was there. And I felt like I wanted more. And it was not, I wanted more like, oh, I want to get to Christ. It was more of, there's got to be more than this. There has to be more. And um, there just has to be more. And so I went for that moreness, and that decision to go for moreness is what then led me to the biggest decision of my life, which was to become a deacon. And that, so it was a preparatory series of steps that were all small. And then the big step was becoming, a, is deciding to become a deacon. And to me, that's how it came out. Does that make sense to you? It does. It, it almost sounds like you're saying in combination, all of these small, almost uh, minuscule decisions, they sort of put you on a path. They sort of gave you a direction to go in, almost like there's a boulder at the top of a hill. And all these little decisions, were you starting to push it? And then it started to roll. Yeah. Is that it's, sort it, of what you're exactly. describing? It's that if I, had, if I had tried to make that decision, like I tried to, to when I considered the priesthood when I left um, uh, college. And I don't think it was a strong de um, decision then, because I couldn't. It was too big a decision. I wasn't ready to it. I needed to push that boulder a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, mm -hmm. and you know, get some of those rocks out that were holding it, uh, holding it in place before I could go and really make this make a large decision like that. I think that when I've talked to other friends of mine, and they're where they were, they're kind of lost where I was lost. Is they're trying to make big decisions. I'm saying make small decisions. Mm -hmm. So let's let's look at what you've said about spirituality as well. Um, you described it as being close with God and as something that you've sort of come into later on in life. Let's start with the a very simple question, a bottom level question. When you say that you're trying to be closer to God, who is it you're trying to be close to? Who is this person that you're you're trying to come into the presence of or that you're trying to relate yourself to? Yeah, I can tell you that I didn't know for a long time who that was. And the, um, the Christ that I saw in, the, in the, uh, the New Testament was not a Christ that I could relate to, to a large degree, because it was too different from my world. You know, it's just too different from my world. And um, uh, it just is, you know, that was just, it was too different from my experiential world uh, for me to get there. And, the, and he was too far off. Uh, and so the person I'm trying to get, it, it really started more with, uh, with this very abstract understanding, as I was saying before about Deuteronomy, uh, the Shema, where it's that it is love God with your whole, whole, whole heart, whole soul, whole mind, love your neighbors yourself. Well, I couldn't understand what loving God meant, because how do you love God? I don't, I didn't, it was just too, it's too abstract for me, but I could get the whole love neighbor thing. I could, I like, I can understand that. And I can understand that. And again, it was selfish because when I did things for people, I felt better when I did things for people. So it was kind of a selfish thing. I felt better. So I did it again. And I just kept doing some of these things. And, uh, and, and even later in my diaconate, when I went, I did hospital ministry, I did things for people. And I felt good about it. But, um, and I started to kind of get what that feeling was. And then I thought, if, if there's something that was responsible for creating all of this, all of it and creating a world that rewards us for loving, right? For feeling the feeling that we're getting and loving. And then I started and I looked and I thought, wow, Christ, boy, this Christ guy, when he came down here and he loved everyone, right? Even when he's, you know, even, even, even uh, loved the other criminal on the cross, you know, at the very end, you know, he's loving people right to the end, forgiving people right to the end. He's dying himself and he's forgiving the guy next to him. When you're looking at that and thinking, and then the resurrection from there, you're thinking, well, if that's God, I can get into that. You know, I could, that makes sense to me, is that if, if, if first, it's, it's to me, if the root for me was love, and to say, if, 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 if Christ is God, which he is, the Trinity, one of the members of the Trinity, if he's God, and he's about, and that's what that love thing is, and what he's, what he's doing, I could understand that. And if God was pure love, which is what I've read, is that he is pure love, I understand how to relate to that now. 
But that took me many years to get to. It wasn't a, a very short thing and a lot of praying to get there. We, when you when you go into the uh, before you become a deacon, you do you spend five years doing all this all this, but you also uh, you also start pray, praying this thing called the liturgy of the hours. You do it in the morning and do it at night. You, well, I do it morning, night, and be and then uh, morning after work and then at night three times a day. And three years I struggled with that because it just was a rote thing I just did. But then when you start to kind of work the whole um, the whole what Christ gave to us, and you start thinking through as you're going through it, and you're praying you're starting to really get closer to what's going on. And I started to feel it. And three years in, it enveloped me. And I thought, and I related that to what the love of God was like through Christ. And it kind of all came together for me. And I said, this is what it is. Now, the, the, the weird thing was, is I was kind of lost because I had all my world tied up in getting, getting more money, getting more things, getting more uh, successful at work. And now, None of that was important. And the only thing that was important was this and, the, and getting and understanding this whole what is God thing to me. That was the only thing that became important to me. And that's where I'm at right now is that's the only thing that's important to me. And if that means and how do I get closer to him? Try to help more people. Try to love more people. Try to do that because that's what he told us to do. A little long-winded, but that's where I'm at. While you, while you were talking about loving, um, you reminded me of one of my favorite lines uh, from uh, a New Testament epistle. It's John's first letter at the very end of the fourth chapter. He talks, or he asks a question, really. How is it that we can claim uh, to love God? How is it that anyone can say they love God who they have not seen if they don't first love their brothers and sisters oh, yeah. who, they, who they have seen? Um, so if God is love, this is what, what you're telling us, then it seems kind of easy to answer the rest of that question uh, about how it is that we become close to God. We love as well. You were talking about uh, the great commandment, as Jesus phrases it, love God, love neighbor. But love, love's a word that gets used a lot, and I'm not sure how it always gets used. So um, we can say we need to love each other, we need to love God, but what does it really mean, Mike, to say love God, love neighbor? What is the action or actions that are associated with loving? You know, it's 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 funny that there's a um uh there's the parable of the sower, which I did a homily on a while ago. And the so and what it is the is the is uh is the um uh, the sower, the farmer, is sowing the sowing seed into the good uh, into the good soil into the rocky soil, onto the ground. Uh, and he says how in the good, uh, in the, uh, in the good soil, it, it raises, uh, it, it, uh, you know, it multiplies um, uh, 90, 60, 30 fold, right? Something like that. And, uh, and in the, in the poor soil, it, uh, it withers up and dies. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, um, you know, and on the road, it, it burns up and nothing ever happens to it. And everybody looks and they say, well, I want to be the good soil. Right, I want to be the good. You know, I'm I'm going to be the good soil guy, right? And you know, I want to be on the road. That's where it all burns up. If you switch your, um, if you but if you switch your, um, uh, uh, and by the way, the seed is God's message, right? It's God's God's word, right? Well, if you think about God's word as being indivisible from God's love, right? Because His word is love. If it, if it's if it's if it's that, and you turn yourself around, and you say, let's not be the soil. Let's be the sower, right? So if God, if God is a sower, his love is so plentiful that he's throwing it in the good, he's throwing it in the bad, he's throwing it everywhere in the smallest hope that something can come of that and that somebody can do something with that. Just the smallest hope is worth it for him. And when I think about the think about love, is I think um, I, I think about what it means to. I, I, I did, I did hospital, I said, I did hospital ministry for a while. And you're looking at somebody who is in pain or they're dying, dying is the tough ones. They're, 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 they're in these situations where sometimes you look at them at the outset and, you know, they're not very pretty at that point. They're not very kind at that point. And yet if you work with them and you talk to them, you could see you could see, I was, I thought it's, it's weird to see, you see God in them. I don't, I see kind of, I see vulnerability and I see, um, I see a, an inkling that they do care 
and then I'm trying to care back to them, trying to spread my love back to them. And I see it be reflected and I see something new start to happen and come from that. Not all the time, but I do see that. And that kind of transaction back and forth to me is if that's the love I can give to them and they can give it back to me, that's got to be the way that we're loving God and look at what it means to be loving God. It's got to be something like that. And when I think about my kids and, um, and then, you know, I don't want to put myself in God, but if I'm, if I'm a father and I'm loving my kids and I do love them unconditionally and no matter what they do, I love them because I see I'm creating their world for them and they are living in that world. And that's that love that, and they love me. And I love them, you know, it's at a different level. I can be mad at them, but I still love them. So to me, this kind of what love means, that to me is what love means. It's, it's that I'm caring more about them. I'm caring more about the person in the hospital bed. I'm caring more about my, my children than I care about myself and getting something out of it. And that weird thing that I said, there was a transition when I used to think that it was about me and how I felt, because I felt good. I did this, I felt good. At some point in the last X number of years, I didn't, I no longer cared how I felt. I felt for them. And if that is, I think, starts to get to, to touch it, to touch what we're talking about between loving God and how you can love God and what, what love means, really. And, you know, these silly things, love means never ever to say you're sorry. No, that's not it. Love means it's, you know, it, it is that agape love we talk about, you know, it's that core caring about an individual and not just how they're feeling right now, but what they are becoming, how they are trying to search through life to get to where you're trying to go. That's, and, and I'm caring more about them in doing that than I care about my own path. And when I can get to there, I'm starting to get to where I think that is. And I think of God, if he's pure love, which is what we've understood, all he cares about is us. That's all he's caring about is us. If I could ever get to there, just like Christ on the, on the cross, looking at the other criminal, he's dying and all he cares about is the other person. He's not worried. I mean, he might be physically in pain, but he doesn't worry about himself. He's worrying about the other person. That's the love that we see. Does that, does that get to it at all? It does. I'm thinking of something I heard about the parable of the prodigal son once. Oh, and it might have been it might have been from you. Um, it was a comment that the word prodigal gets misassigned in that story because the father's the one who's prodigal because he's giving well, let's away define it first. Prodigal yeah. means wasteful, mm -hmm. right? Prodigal yeah. means wasteful. Okay, a lot of people don't know that. Prodigal means wasteful. Keep going. Sorry. And so the comment was that it's the father who's being prodigal in the story, who's giving away excessively because of how he loves the son. And I've always found that curious because if we are supposed to see God as the father in this story, it's an interesting way of looking at how God loves us. He's willing to give away more and more and more, even if he knows it might only help occasionally. Even if he knows we might take that love and toss it aside sometimes, he's still, he's still giving it wants to keep giving and that's why it's like that the parable of the sower mm -hmm. you know where, where we switch it he's just giving it and the prodigal son it's it you're right it's the prodigal father <laughs> right who's, who's giving it but he doesn't care the point is with the father is what's really interesting is he gave away half or a third he get, uh, of everything he didn't care when he came back he wasn't mad about that he was so interested in how his son was doing and when i see that kind of relationship it's very um it, it gets me closer to uh, the to, to to that, and it, it gets me a lot closer to understanding that. And um, yeah, it's that's a cool cool way you're saying that the 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 prodigal uh, it's almost the prodigal father, you know, in that one. That's um, yeah, it is interesting. So, you know me, I love to define things. So I'm gonna I'm gonna offer a definition of love based on what you've been saying, and I want you to tell me whether or not it it lines okay. up with what you've been saying or not. It seems to me like you're talk what you've said, you've been talking about two different aspects of love. There's a generosity involved with it. That's the givingness of oneself. And then there's a selflessness or an outward lookingness to love. 
where love is aimed at the other. Love is for the other. And the giving that is being done, it always comes from us to the other. Is that a good way yeah, to sum I, up what you've been I saying? Think it, I think it is. And I think the time, let me get with it because mm -hmm. I agree with you. Generosity is there, but the selflessness is I think where it's at is when you get that, when you get to the spot where you truly are not, there's no aspect of what you're doing that's about you. When there's no aspect of what you're doing that's about you, and you're only focused on the other individual. I think you're getting to where, what, what it, this means. And it, it, and when we're, and when we're, and when I try to understand God and the concept of love, it's in a weird way, it's, I'm not thinking I love God. What I'm thinking is he loves me in this way that is so um, selfless that me just recognizing that and recognizing and trying to live my life to understand that this is a selflessness that's coming to me and that I'm receiving that selflessness. And he's expecting me to offer that same selflessness to other people in, in, this, in this world. I think that's what it is because I, I still have a hard time saying that I'm loving God selflessly because God doesn't need my prayers and God doesn't need my love. What he needs is and what he wants and he desires is for me to understand how much he loves us, you know, and the gift that he gave us through Christ, you know, through himself to come down. And you should talk about that. The guy didn't even, you know, the guy had all the choices in the world. He could do anything he wanted to do. And he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go down to the earth that I created there. And um, I'm going to spend 30 years teaching everybody exactly what I want what I, what I want from them, right? After I took 2,000 years to reveal myself uh, as to what it is. But I'm going to teach them what I want. And then because I need them to really understand how far they need to go, not just to the point of saying do something, but they need to go as far as dying on a cross. And, and this, the, you know, this other criminal thing really is so important to me. Dying on a cross, and as you're dying, continue to feel for the other guy at that moment, not yourself. That's how far he wants us to go. That's love. And that's been demonstrated to us, and that's cool. So I want to talk about uh, uh, a concrete example of this, this givingness, the ministry of, of a deacon. So... So far in our interviews, we've had a community member, so a layperson from the Newman Center and a, uh, one of our students. And then we're also going to be talking to a priest, Father Roy, in our final interview. But you as a deacon, you have, you have a special role in the church that we haven't quite seen yet in the people that I've talked to previously. So I'd like to go into that a little more. You introduced what the diaconate is uh, at the very beginning in your response to the first question. I want to ask this. Where do you see deacons fitting into the church, if you will? The priests, they celebrate the mass, they celebrate all the sacraments. Lay people, they're involved in various ministries that are carried out through churches. They're the worshipers on a Sunday. Where's the deacon during all of this? What is it that the deacon's primary responsibility to the church is? Well, I think that the primary response, well, let's see, think of it this way. I think that one of the jobs that I have is, is that to show to the congregation what it means to know that first, I am, um, my job is to serve Father Pat. That's my job. Now, the, the diocese will say, no, no, I'm like, you're, you technically work for the bishop, but I don't, look, nobody pays me. <laughs> I don't know, you know, I mean, I'm, working for the you know, I, you know father pat is the one that i'm um you know i'm looking for and my job is to be is is to know that i'm being uh, that i'm honoring that uh that that number one is that i honor that relationship it means something to me and that's number one and i want other people to see the fact that that it's that, that these priests are worthy of being honored in what they've put in what they've committed to the uh to, to there that's number one i think the second thing is is that my job is to is that as a a priest is an unmarried person who does not have the burdens and the joys of family and of, uh, of worldly problems. They have a lot of problems that they're dealing with all the time. 
that, that they have to deal with. They have to keep the church finances going. They have to watch the flock. They have, you know, their, their flock they're responsible for. They hold a, a, an immense responsibility in terms of trying to do that. But my job is different. My job is to try to bridge that gap between a person who is solely focused on, uh, on the flock, right, which is the, which is the priest, and how to relate to the person in the, in the pews or in the, in the congregation in a way that I'm like me. I mean, I'm, I'm like us, right? I'm us, right? Uh, 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 you know, I'm us. You know, and um, I, when I'm talking, when I'm doing a homily, when I'm talking about, when I'm talking about baptism, baptism, my kids were baptized. All four of my kids were baptized. I was there. I was, you know, I was the father standing there while my kids were baptized. I know what it feels like when, uh, when, uh, when we're doing a homily and when I'm doing a homily and I'm talking about what it, uh, what it means to be, you know, what, what family is, uh, you know, uh, Feast of the Holy Family is coming up on the 28th. I have a family, you know, I, I, and, and I have it with the good and the bad. And for me to be able to explain and say, look, there is bad, there is tough, but there's also good. And I'm talking from an from experience base. I have that. When I have, uh, when we talk about, uh, when we talk about husbands and, uh, husbands and wives, I have a wife. I've been married for 32 years. I know what that's like. I know what my wife puts up with for me, and I know how that is, and I I know that I can talk, I can try to connect, and try to connect the Christ's message, the catechism, the overall gestalt of the um, of, of the church and what it's there to do, and try to connect that to uh, to a real family with real experience. That's what I can do, and that's what I can bring to it. Also, I can help Father Pat uh, to, to take some of the burden off of the things he, ha he has to do that are, are not, frankly, I, I don't, I want to say burden. With Father Pat, there is no burden. It's all <laughs> just stuff he wants to do, but he just can't do everything, right? There is no burden. He's the first one to say, I'll do the baptism. He loves doing baptisms. He loves doing weddings. He loves doing, he, he loves doing funerals to be with people, right, in terms of doing that. But to help him and uh, to, to, to kind of share the load a little bit. And also to share some of the joy of, of what it's like to do that. So when you talked about the decision that you made to become a deacon before, you were saying that it was one that followed from a bunch of earlier decisions that you made. It was something that was made possible because of how you had developed your faith, your spirituality over time. You made that sound like a very positive thing. I want to ask about being a deacon for now about a year and a half are there are there negative parts of of this role of this responsibility that you've now experienced are there things that have become more difficult now that you've made this choice to serve the church as a deacon how has it affected mike colson as a person as that every man who understands what goes on in a in an average in a usual family how has this additional responsibility affected him it's um, first. First thing I would say to that is that I look at what Father Pat does, and you don't really get a sense for everything he does until you just see it a little closer. I mean, I'm I'm not in his shoes. He is. He has his own large shoes he fills, but I am I am a little closer to seeing what he has what he what he has to do and how he has to work his uh, his day, his week, his year. And the responsibility he carries, as I said, his job is to care for the flock, to care for his flock, to build a community. And what's made it, I, I see some of the weight he's carrying, and it's frustrating because I thought that, I thought I could really help him a lot. And you realize that, you know, he's at a whole different level than me in terms of what he's doing. And you feel inadequate because you don't feel like you can really, you know, I can't be the way he does things. I can't, um, when the day is done, it's his community. I'm, I'm just walking through it. You know, it's, it's his community. And I wish I could be, I wish I could be more help than I am. Um, I tried to help as much as I can. So it's, it's, so 
the, the, the negative side for me was I really felt like I would be more help to him in growing the community. What I find is that I am so overwhelmed with what we have to do now, what I have to do and how I'm doing what I'm doing. Not my family stuff, just helping at the church that it's, I wish I had more time to be able to really take on more ministries and do more things and actually have more of an impact than I'm having now. I wish I could. I just, and I know all I have to do is spend more time. I just don't have more time right now. And that's the thing is that I wish I had that. So the, so the drawback is that. And when we were going through the diaconate, a lot of people said it was going to be that um, it was going to take a strain, it would be a strain on my family and a strain on my wife. And that just hasn't happened. You know, my, my kids are older. Um, you know, my, my youngest is 17, uh, but my oldest is 30. And they're, they're on their own. They're doing their thing. Uh, they're doing their thing now. And my wife really participates in a lot of what I do. So, um, you know, in terms of she taught RCIA with me, she we did 15 years of confirmation. She taught RCIA with me. She's, um, you know, she shows up at all the baptisms with me usually. She, you know, the communion services she goes to with me. So it's not, that's not, that's not the strain uh, for, for me. And that's, that's, that's turned into a very, another blessing that I really get to have in there. So in terms of what has been the, the, the downside is, it's, it's this feeling that, I wish I could do more. And, and, and also, frankly, too, is that when the other thing that, that really gets me, and it's hard, is this whole church scandal that's gone on now, the sex abuse scandal. It's, you know, it's tough because there are true people that have been harmed, and those people have to be made whole. They do. But the vast, vast majority of these, of these priests have dedicated their lives to, uh, to, um, to, to, to bringing Christ and bringing communities together, dedicated their lives to it, and they're painted sometimes with the same brush. And I understand, it's hard to know, but it's tough for me, and that's too bad. It's just tough and it's too bad, but it's something we just have to go through. That's it. So I do want to, to pivot to looking at things that have been more positive uh, as you've served as a deacon. Um, is there anything that stood out to you as being particularly, especially rewarding in, in your work as a deacon? Oh, baptisms without a doubt. Mm -hmm. I love doing baptisms. I can do baptisms all day and all night. Seeing the little kids, you know, you know all over. I mean, just it's amazing. I was uh, doing the whole Father Pat thing where, um, where, you, where the kids help, they blow on the water as, as we're blessing it. And this three-year-old girl there. She's, uh, she's blowing on the water. So I stand up and start to do my things. I look back and she has her face in the water. She's blowing bubbles. And you just, and I thought Christ would love this. She, he would love this. This is exactly, this is, baptisms are awesome. Weddings, a fantastic experience seeing weddings go. I mean, just a unbelievable experience. Homilies, to sit and be able to sit and just deliver these things. And I work really hard on these homilies. It may not show, but I work really hard on these homilies to try to do something. And try to communicate something. But I love doing them. Communion services I love. I mean, I love all the things I do. I, I, I love there. It's just, wow. I mean, I sit there and I can't believe that I get a front row seat to a baptism, to a wedding, to, to, to communicating these things. I can't believe I get a front row seat to doing all that. I, I just can't believe it. I married my daughter. I mean, my, I mean my, my daughter and her husband, I married them. I mean, who gets to do that in their life, right? Who gets to do that? I had the best seat in the house. <laughs> so um, I have one more question for you, Mike, if I can. I've been asking everyone I've interviewed so far about daily routines that they have, something you, you always do when you get up in the morning because I'm interested in what the, the, the equivalent, the analog to a cup of coffee in the morning would be for a spiritual practice. What would you say to people is one thing they, should, they, they could try and do every day uh, to start their day off right with respect, to, with respect to God, with respect to being close to him like we were talking about earlier? Yeah, there's, these, there's the, um, um, before I was in the, uh, uh, before I was in the diaconate, 
Um, I, uh, uh, every morning, well, not, I would say three or four years before I did that, every morning I would, I would um, pray the rosary. And when I first started, I was thinking, you know, this maybe sounds sacrilegious. I thought it was pretty boring at first. I thought, you know, doing this, I thought, geez, just keep saying the same prayer over and over again. I mean, what's, what's that going to do for me? Right. But, um, but then I started to think more about you, you do the, uh, what the, what each decade means and what, you know, what you're trying to do. And you think about that as it goes. And that meant a lot to me after a little while it did. Now I replaced that with the liturgy of the hours where we, the liturgy of the hours, we, uh, we say, uh, and uh, you, it's a prayer book, a Christian prayer book that you use, and you go through a number of psalms, and you go through a number of uh, a number of psalms, a number of a, a reading, and uh, you 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 pray and you commune with God. And the very first thing I do every morning before I do anything else, I wake up, I go to my couch, I pull out my Christian prayer book, and I say the morning and I say morning prayer, and it it helps me a lot. That's my cup of coffee. I say, I say the morning prayer. It takes me about 15, 16, 17 minutes to do it in the morning. And I do that. And, and for years, it was a struggle in the beginning because, you know, I, I struggle with every single one of these things I struggle with, right? But then I get into it. I understand what I'm doing. And I could sit there and I could, I could really, the morning prayer is all about, uh, all about thanking God for, um, for, uh, for waking up, thanking God uh, for this day and knowing that God is our protector. And God is our, you know, God is here to protect us and that it's God's will, not our will that we're doing. And to start the day knowing he's here to protect us and it's God's will, not our will. It's a beautiful thing. And the gift he gives us is the day. That is my morning. You know, that is my morning thing I do. At the end of the day, um, usually it's after dinner, I do night prayer. And night prayer, thanks him for thanks for the day. But it also looks, looks and reflects back on the decision that Mary had to make when Mary said, I will be the, you know, I, I will be the carrier of Christ. I'll be the carrier of God and goes through that. And it, it helps me center that. And then at the end of the day at night prayer, you know, at like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, I do a night prayer that only takes about eight or nine minutes. And it really just kind of, so you really examine your conscience and you say, what could I have done better for the day? And then, uh, and then also goes, goes in to say, protect me, Lord, as you know, uh, as, uh, you know, as, as stay awake and through the night, you know, be, you know, be with me through the night and get me, get me ready for the next day. To me, those three things anchor my spirituality throughout the day. And they try to keep me on path, on the path during the day. And I veer off like crazy all day, every day. And that brings me back. And sometimes I have to go way back in order to get to where I started you know, there. But that's what I do. Thank you very much, Mike. I hope, if nothing else, everyone who's watched today can take from you uh, a lesson about pushing that rock, about keeping at those, those little, little steps, making those little choices every day. So hopefully one day the, the big rock can start rolling and you can end up with, with a full-blown faith, with uh, a complete spirituality. I, 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 and as soon as I get there, I'll tell you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Thank you, Josh, for the opportunity to be, uh, to talk to people and, and, and share a little bit of my experience. So thank you again to Mike. Thank you to everyone who has watched today. Uh, next week, our interview series will continue. We'll be speaking to Andrew Pfeiffer, uh, a current UB uh, student. He's a uh, doctoral student in the philosophy department. So uh, next week's conversation, I can promise you, will be a little bit different. You may not understand all the words being used. I may not understand all the words being used, but I'm, I'm sure you'll learn something uh, from Andrew. So please join us next week. Uh, for now, um, stay safe, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you again in the future.